Got it. Got it. Uh, it's not the first time which I speak in this uh, in this hall. It's at least the third or the fourth time. And again, I have the honor, not to mention the pleasure of speaking to you. We are at war. You know it. We are the 93rd day. 93rd day of the war, which is after the independence war, it's the second war in length. The number of casualties since it started on Shmini Atzeret is also very big compared to previous years. In 1967, the number of casualties was less than 700 since in Sheshet Today, we are already more than double, especially since we count the casualties of the first day of the surprise which Israel was caught by on that horrible Shmini uh, Atzer. We know about this war with Hamas, but there are some things which are behind the scenes about which I would like to speak tonight. Philosophy of war mentions three elements which every army should have before it starts a war, and without which, wait until you have them all. The first element is to be prepared from the technical point of view. It means to have weapons, ammunition, plans, intelligence, and um, people who are trained in order to carry out action. This is from the technical point of view, the preparation. The second element is psychological preparation. It means your soldiers should be motivated, should know what they fight for, should have the willingness to get into war, to fight, and maybe to sacrifice themselves on the altar of the shared good. They should be uh, willing to go to war. Otherwise, don't go to war. If your soldiers are not motivated enough, do something in this before you go to war, because they will not fight. Or they will find the easiest way how to finish the war much sooner, much before they finish the job because they don't want to be killed. So this, you, you need the kavana, the intention to uh, enter a war in order to win the war. This is the second element, psychological element. The third one is an opportunity. Look for an opportunity when your enemy falls asleep, when he's not alert, when he doesn't understand what happens with him, attack at that time. The chance that you win the war, if you if you catch your enemy by surprise, go, go for this. Look for the opportunity and try to use it. If you have all the three elements, the techn technical preparations, ammunition, weapons, training, and uh, intelligence, psychological preparations means motivation to your troops, and you have the opportunity, go for the war. You might win in this war. This is something which I didn't invent. This is the already the military thought of Clausewitz, one who founded the art of war, as he called it, already over 200 years ago. When we look at uh, Hamas, the other side, which is my field of research and interest, we 
see how they got uh, armed by Iran. We see all kinds of uh, weapons which were developed, especially for the Palestinian fighters in order to deal uh, better with the Israeli weapons. I'll give you one, exa one example. You know what RPG is? RPG is a, by the way, it's 60 years old. It's an ancient almost weapon, which was uh, developed in the 60s in order to replace the bazooka of those times. Uh, the RPG is being shot to short range, 200 meters, 300 meters, not, not much more. Uh, and it has a hollow charge. Hollow charge means some kind of design, designation of the of design of, of, the, of the weapon, which sends a very concerned a, a, a stream of heat, very high heat, which uh, dissolves the armor of the tank. It could be 50 centimeters of armor, 60 centimeters to that, that hut, it, this uh, stream of heat and enters the space of the, the inner space of the tank and burns everything. This is the RPG, the traditional one. Israel developed a system named Me'il Ruach, Me'il Ruach, which actually does something in order to blow the RPG hollow charge before it touches the tank. I won't get into details, but this Me'il Ruach is designed to blow the RPG up before it reaches the tank. So what did the Iranian, ah, now this uh, system before, it, it needs one second, the whole second to re, or to shoot again. After it shoots first time, it needs one second in order to be prepared for the next one. One second, of course, if there are two people who shoot at you, one second is not a big deal. You can deal with both of them. So what did the Iranians develop? They developed a double RPG, which the man shoots, and one will be dealt with by Meir Ruach, and the other one hits the tank after half a, half a second, before the system uh, rearranges itself for the next hit, okay? So this is a weapon, a kind of weapon, which the Iranians developed especially in order to deal with the Israeli armored vehicles, like tanks, like uh, uh, carriers, uh, personal carriers. So this is, this is what I mean by to be prepared to deal with the Israeli uh, weapons. So, and Hamas got this kind of uh, RPG, double RPG, and they were using it, unfortunately, uh, efficiently. And um, so, and they had a lot of missiles, a lot of rockets, a lot of whatever you need, you know, in order to uh, um, wage a big war against us. And now the question is, how did they get so much, uh, so so many weapons, so many, so much of ammunition? And this is another question from Sinai, through uh, Israel as well, to the sea from Hezbollah, and uh, these were more or less the three sources of of uh, the weapons which they got to Gaza. And they were prepared. They prepared an army of like 20,000 uh, fighters. Means in order to get rid of them, you have to kill them all. 20,000. So how many on the way will be killed in collateral, collateral uh, damage? So can you imagine? And uh, they were arranged in some uh, battalions, in some uh, brigades, and uh, definitely arranged and prepared for the war. When it comes to the second element, the motivation, here things are much more complicated and a bit hard to understand for us Israelis or us Westerners. Because this is a very tricky, a very tricky 
uh, thing, and rather complicated because it's connected to, to Islam and the way which they view us uh, as a kind of uh, motivation to act against us. The, the basis of the idea of fighting against Israel is the fact that Israel has no right to exist even on one square centimeter on uh, Hof Natania or Tel Aviv or wherever. Israel is occupation since 1948, not the parts which were liberated or occupied in 1967. The occupation started in 1948. So Israel has to be wiped out altogether from the map or from the, from the ground. So it doesn't really matter if they attack Itamar or uh, Ariel in the Shomron or any place in, in Yehuda, or Be'eri, Faraza, uh, Nir Oz, Nachal Oz, Sufa, all these kibbutzim which are in the perimeter of, uh, of Gaza. Because this also an occupation. And I'll, I'll, I'll put it to you later. Uh, you know, let's, let's see now. Uh, I, I visited once the uh, Birzet University near Ramallah. Uh, when I was still in the university, I, uh, I'm retired from two years already. And uh, I saw the, in, in the campus a whole table of uh, Hamas. And they were giving out the materials, uh, printed materials. And they also gave this scarf. Uh, in this, you see the, the color of Ben Eden. And uh, the the emblem, the logo of Hamas in that university is this. You can see it. Uh, it shows here the whole country, the whole Eretz Israel. This is Metula, this is Eilat, with a book on it. The book is the Quran. How do I know? It shows a verse in the Quran, which is from uh, chapter, uh, chapter 60 which says, uh, and prepare against them, is an order by Allah to the Muslims, and prepare against them, means against the infidels. Whatever you have from power and bound horses, in order to strike terror into the hearts of your enemies and the enemies of Allah. Means they are ordered to strike terror into the hearts of their enemies. as a kind of how to paralyze the enemies. Why kill them? You can use them. If they are afraid enough to, you can rape them, you can do many things before you kill them. So this is more or less the, the, the translation of the verse, which is on the logo, on the logo of the Hamas branch in Bir Zed University. So this is why they, why they have universities, okay? So this is the, the, uh, the, the whole state of Israel is here, this way. The whole state of Israel is occupation. Israel has no right to exist because of, let's say, four reasons. One reason is the religion. Judaism is null and void since Christianity came to the world to replace Judaism, you know, the theory of replacement. But uh, Islam came to the world to replace Christianity and Judaism as well. Means, well, why this all happened? Because the Jews, when they got the Torah, it uh, means the Torah, they changed and forged it. Means they betrayed Allah by changing his word uh, in the Torah. So Allah took the Besorah, the gospel from from the Jews and gave it to the Christians in the form of the Injil. Injil means the Evangelions, means the books of the messengers. But they also changed and forged the word of Allah. So Allah took the gospel from them and gave it to the Muslims in the form of Quran Arabi Mubin, means Quran in Arabic, very clear. And now nobody can change it, nobody can forge it. And the, because the real believers, the true believers, hold 
their book and they save it from any change of the Jews and the Christians. Therefore, since Judaism and Christianity also are null and void, cancelled, as we say in Arabic, Din Batil, that Betela, and only Islam is Din Haq, that Emet, religion of truth. So there is no reason for a Jewish state to exist because there is no Judaism anymore since this process started. So from the religious point of view, Israel has no right to exist. The, the second problem is that the Jews are not a nation. Jews are communities which belong to all the nations in the world. An American Jew is an American who happened to be Jewish, just like other Americans who are Christian or other religions. A, a Jew in Morocco is a Moroccan Arab who happened to be Jewish, just like other Moroccan Arabs who will be Muslims, Christians, or whatever they are. A Jew in Iraq, the same, is an Iraqi Arab who is Jewish. A Jew in Russia is a Russian national uh, who okay, happened to be Jewish. So why there are other Russians who are Muslims and, and Christians? So, well, religion is not the basis of an ethnic group, in their view. Why? Because they project on us their situation. The Islamic world is divided to many nationalities. There are Arabs who are Muslim. There are Turks, Kurds, Persians, Azerbaijanis, Tajikis, Uz Uzbeks, and uh, peoples in uh, in Africa, Niger, Chad, Mali, and all of them are different ethnic groups. Islam as a religion did not galvanize them to, to turn them into one ethnic group named Islamic. So there is no Islamic ethnic nation. Okay? Because these are Arabs, these are Turks, these are Kurds, and so forth. Okay? So why should Judaism combine different communities, Russian, American, British, uh, Iraqi, uh, 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 Moroccan, Yemenite, all these Jewish communities to one nation? Since when a religion combines different groups into one, one national group? It doesn't happen in there, so why should, why should it happen with the Jews? So they don't accept the fact that we claim that we are one nation because we are one religion. They don't see the connection between religion and nationality or ethnic. Uh, so uh, this is why they reject the idea that there is a Jewish nation. Therefore, you don't need the Jewish state if there is no such a nation. The third problem is the Islamic halakha, the Sharia. The Sharia states that any land in the world has only one way ticket, to enter the house of Islam, not to get out. Means any land which ever was under Islamic rule should remain Islamic, and if somebody dares to take it out from the Islamic uh, uh, rule, he should be punished and the land should return to be Islamic. By the way, this is why Spain, the Iberian Peninsula, means Portugal and Spain, should return to be Islamic because Muslims ruled Spain for some 700 years. Uh, the island of Sicily, in the southern part of Italy, uh, large parts of the Balkans, uh, including uh, Greece and what was Yugoslavia, was Croatia, uh, Montenegro, all the way north to Vienna, where they were defeated on September 11, 1683. Since the hoofs of their horses once were all the way up to Vienna, capital of Austria, all this space belongs to them. Why? Because they were there. So, uh, Palestine, definitely. I mean, Palestine, uh, the country which we live in. So, uh, uh, so, from this point of view, the, the, the land point of view, Israel is a state of the Jews whose religion is null and void and they are not even a, a nation. 
was taken by force from the Islamic world and was given to, to the Jews. Who took it from the Islamic world? The British, the Christians. Means in the First World War, France and Britain defeated the Ottoman Empire and took the whole Levant. Means what today, in Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, Jordan, Eretz Israel, Egypt, and so forth. They left the Ottoman Empire only in Turkey of today. Okay? And they, in, in 1917, the Balfour Declaration means those who don't own it gave it to those who don't deserve it. This is how they say. Now, Lord Balfour, they know he was an evangelical Anglican Christian. And he was believing Christian, religious Christian. Who gave it to him to give it to the Jews? They look at the Balfour Declaration of 1917 as a conspiracy of Christianity and Judaism against Islam in order to bring Judaism back to life by bringing them back to the land and establish a Bayit Leumi, a national home for the Jewish people. This is the Balfour Declaration of 1917. Later, April of 1920, the San Remo Convention of the League of Nations. League of Nations, you know, it's the organization which preceded the United Nations, which was established after the Second World. Between the World Wars, the League of Nations was the international community. And in 1920, April, the, the League of Nations had a convention in San Remo in Italy, and they decided to endorse the Balfour Declaration and to elevate it from the status of a letter sent to the Zionist movement by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Her Majesty, now it became an international document, which is much higher from the legal point of view. And this actually, this, the San Remo decision, which, is, which weighs much, uh, a much, much bigger weight in the international uh, uh, law uh, uh, for the legi legis leg legitimacy of the state of Israel from the judicial point of view. Or legal rights of the Jewish people are based more on the San Remo decision rather than the Balfour Declaration. Okay? Now, they, who, who voted? Japan, Russia, Argentina. Who the heck gave this land to the Japanese to give it to the Jews? Who are they to vote in such a, in, in, in such a, in a matter to give the Jews the land of Muslims? Since when Japanese are, are, are deciding about Islamic lands, those who hate Islam anyway, and the Russians and the Argentinians? Okay. So for them, the San Remo uh, Convention, which is the most solid basis of Israel legal rights, they see it as null and void because the basis, the ownership of the land did not belong to the uh, League of Nations. It belongs to Islam. Forever. So who are they? So the state of Israel, since it, of course, uh, and it came you know, to the world in, in 1948, the declaration at the end of the mandate. And this is something which is, again, against Islam. Why? Jews, because they did not believe in Muhammad and because they did not adhere to, to the Islamic uh, religion, they should live as Zimmis, al zimma in Arabic. Zimmis means people who live under the auspice of Islam. In terms and in conditions that the Islam imposes on them. For example, a Jew, of course, he is safe on his body and his property only if he adheres to the laws. And the laws are only part of them. A Jew and a Christian cannot ride a horse, only a donkey in order to humiliate. A Jew and a Christian should not sell wine in the street, in the market, because a Muslim can uh, buy it and drink it, and this is forbidden in Islam. A Christian cannot sell pork in the marketplace because of the same reason. And Jew, a Jew and a Christian cannot be in con any connection 
with citizens of other countries because they might reveal our secrets. Uh, they, they call the tharat, means the cracks in our defenses. So they cannot com communicate with other nations, only as messengers which are sent officially by the government. Uh, a Jew and a Christian should pay jizya, means masgul golet, uh, head tax, when they are humiliated, because this uh, states in the Quran, because the Quran says the Jews and Christians should pay them the jizya from their hand while they are humiliated. Therefore, many tax collectors were forcing the Jew and the Christian who came to pay once a month their monthly dues to crawl on the ground, come to the tax collector, and to get a kick in order to implement the pasuk, the ayah in the Quran, which says they should be humiliated by being kicked out from the room. And a, a Jew and a Christian have no status in the Sharia court. They cannot sue a Muslim. So even if a Muslim bursted into the Jewish home and uh, uh, took his property and humiliated his daughters, they cannot sue him because they have no status. They are statusless people. And many more uh, halachot like this, uh, which define, which describe the status of Jews as themis. I highly recommend that you put your hand on a book written by Bat Yeor. Bat Yeor is the pen name of a lady named Giselle Littmann, who lives in Switzerland. She was born in Egypt. This is why she calls herself Bat Yeor. And uh, she writes books, uh, usually in English, uh, in, in about Islam. Uh, she is not an ac academician because the academicians are too low in their knowledge compared to her. <laughs> she knows way much more than many academicians about Islam because, because she has direct access to Islamic sources because she speaks Arabic. And she wrote a book, Islam and Thimitude. Islam, I think this is the title of the book. The book. Google, but you all Thimitude and purchase the book. This book actually describes all the ways how uh, Jews and Christians were treated uh, uh, in the Islamic world. Of course, uh, they didn't come to the degree of hatred of uh, what we experienced in Europe, but uh, definitely uh, Jews did not enjoy living under. Look, in Yemen, uh, in Yemen, uh, any boy or a girl who are orphans were forced to be converted to Islam, be given to the Islamic community in order to take care of them, because if they don't have parents, they they should embrace it in Islam and should be Islamized by force. So uh, this why but this by the way is the reason why boys and girls in Yemen were married out in very early very early age, like five six, in order to make sure that if they lose the parents, they will not be forced to be given to the local authorities, to the imam, in order to be converted. So this is how, how Jews should live under uh, Islamic rule. Jews have no right to a state. Jews have no right to an army. Jews have no right to a police, Mishmaragvul, or any government, because these are all signs of sovereignty, which Jews should not have. Jews, therefore, should live under the auspice of Islam as Vimis. And all of a sudden, Jews uh, 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 occupy an Islamic land with the blessing of the Christian world as a collaboration, a conspiracy of uh, the of Christianity and Judaism together. And they establish a state, although they are not eligible to have any state. Then in 1967, they occupy another part of the country and Jerusalem. And Rabbi Goren, the rabbi of the army, wants to build a synagogue on the Temple Mount, on the uh, northern part, far from the Al-Aqsa Mosque, on a part of the Temple Mount, which was outside from the original temple. Uh, therefore, we can go there. And, um, uh, and Jews today want to go to, to Harabai, to, to the, to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which was, and they know that it was, Beit, Beit HaMikdash, because the ancient name in Arabic of Jerusalem is Beit el Makdis, which is clear where it came from. So uh, uh, the Jews wants to pray 
in the Temple Mount, and this way, by this having the state controlling Jerusalem and and praying on the Temple Mount, actually Judaism came back to life in the form of a state, in the form of government, army, police, all these manifestations of sovereignty and the land, of course, which they control, and praying again in the Temple Mount, it all means that Judaism came back to life. What will be this land? Which came to the world in order to replace Judaism. This resurrection of Judaism, they cannot fathom it. They cannot take it. They cannot accept it. Because in, in their mind, there is a danger on Islam, on the mere existence, or the, a danger on the raison d'etre of Islam, which came to the world in order to replace Judaism and Christianity. And here now, and, 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 and President Trump of the United States, supported by the uh, evangelicals, recognizes Jerusalem as the capital of the Jews. Excuse me, who gave him Jerusalem to give it to the Jews? This is the question which they, which they ask. Therefore, Israel, in their view, is a theologic threat on Islam before it is anything connected to territory or to uh, political rights or human rights or whatever rights. It is a theologic threat on Islam. And whoever threatens Islam from the religious point of view, we cancel Islam because if Judaism comes back to life, what is the reason that of Islam? So th th their motivation to get rid of the state of Israel is this motivation, to get rid of the danger on Islam. This is what motivates them. Now, I'm more than sure that most of you didn't know it because unfortunately the Israeli media and the Western media they don't talk about these things because who the heck thinks about religion in this world where most of the Western people are atheistic and they they view religion as something old, which I don't know, belongs to all kinds of backward people, as people think. We are progressive, means we left all the traditions behind us. And this is how the world, that's why it's so hard to explain to Europeans and Americans as well, the essence of the problem with Hamas. They see them, they shoot us, that's all they see. That's what they understand. Terrorism. But they don't understand the motivation which pushes them to shoot, bomb, and whatever. So this is the religious motivation which Hamas, and you know what? I highly recommend that everyone, after you go, go home, have a cup of coffee, Go to Google, go to Google, and uh, uh, Google, uh, in Hebrew it's Amanat HaHamas, uh, the Hamas Charter, which was formulated in 1988, a few months after Hamas was established, uh, just in English. It, it is very well translated to English. You can see how many uh, uh, verses from the Quran are embedded in this uh, text, and how many quotations from the Hadith, from the oral tradition, which are also are uh, in, in this, uh, in this uh, document, we, to, to, to sense how, how much they are rooted in the 7th century literature of Islam, means the Quran and the Hadith. It's not something which came up uh, recently. The, 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 the roots of the ideology goes all the way to the earliest sources of Islam, means the Quran and the Hadith. I give you one, one example. That in the Hadith, there is a verse which here appears in the charter, which says that the hour, the big H, the hour of the uh, end of the day, uh, end of days, um, will not come until Muslims will fight the Jews and kill them. No.
Hello, the reception has been frozen on Zoom. Looks like it. Rocks and trees. Okay, this is the hadith, and this is, this appears in the in the charter. Now, people would say, "Why do they believe in really? They believe in it? that a, a tree and, and, and a rock will start shouting, oh, Muslim, a Jew is hiding behind you.'" Okay, I have a friend who works uh, not far from here in Fayona. There is a factory there. And he works with Arab friends. And he has one of the Arabs, a very good friend. And the, the families are friendly. They, they go to each other's smachot, you know, chatunot. They, they are very friendly with his, with his Arabs. And uh, the kids uh, know each other. One day, his Arab friend took him aside and told him, you have a house, right? You have a little garden over there. Yes, you should uh, uh, plant say uh, Ozrad, uh, a tree, I don't know how it's in English, it's Ozrad uh, in Hebrew. It's kind of a tree. Why? That hadith says, after it says the rocks in the, in the tree will shout, all the trees will cooperate except one tree, the Ozrad, the Arkad in Arabic. Mm -hmm. So the Arab friend gave him good advice. <laughs> have these trees in your garden. Okay. Because these trees will not give you it. Okay? So this is the, the degree they believe uh, in, in, in the realism of uh, this uh, prophecy of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. So this is, the, the, so this is how they view us uh, in Israel. And this is the source of the motivation of uh, Hamas. Yet there are some recent uh, motivations. And of course, to get rid of the state of Israel is a mitzvah, dola. but uh, recently it became urgent. What urgent? The uh, Saudi Israeli advancement in the negotiations, which took place last year. And here we come to the actually to the, what happened. For me, this war started in April, like man, nine months ago. I correspond with uh, some dozens of Arabs who correspond with me, you know, regular basis through WhatsApp, through Telegram, through email, through uh, Twitter, X today. Facebook, all kinds of media, and uh, it's not such a big burden, but uh, I, I do, I try to answer questions, as long as the questions are nice questions, ask them in the own. Uh, blood and tears and uh, many, most of the Christians ran away and Christians were like one of six of the Iraqi population uh, even one of the Saddam's uh, deputies was uh, a Christian guy his name was Tariq Aziz he used to go with a cross on his uniform uh, yeah, okay, everybody knew that he's Christian and everybody honored him um, as a Christian however since uh, the war started in 2003. Most of the Christians ran away, including my friend. And he lives in Europe. But he is still in connection with people in Iraq, especially those who are against Iran. Because as you know, Iran implanted some 50 militias in Iraq only. 50 Shia, Shia militias or Iranian uh, who operate in in Iraq. He is against them, against the Iranians, and many Iraqis are also against. 
and they give him all kinds of information about the Iranian expansion in Iraq. Once in a while, he sends me all kinds of pieces of information, and I usually just forward it to a friend of mine in the army, in, in intelligence. What they do with this, I don't know, and this is more or less what they do with this. In early April uh, last, last year, he writes to me uh, something which I saw that it came from Iraq, which says that the Iranian government or Iranian Mishmerot the IRGC, um, they ordered the militias, the, the, the pro-Iranian militias in Iraq, the 50 militias, to get, to get ready to a war against Israel, which in their part will be three or three kinds of war. One is launching missiles against Israel from Iraq. Uh, another one was to, to send um, drones at uh, from Iraq as well. And the third is to move to Syria in order to invade Israel in the Golan uh, as a ground operation. And this order came also to the 17 or Iranian militias in Syria, to Hezbollah, to Hamas, and the Islamic Jihad, and another small organization in Gaza, and to the Houthis in Yemen. Hamas was in charge of making sure that the Hamas activists, or Hamas terrorists in today in Samaria, will join the war as well, and hopefully the Arab sector in Israel as well, as was in May 2021, and they all should uh, make plans, prepare plans for each and everyone's war against Israel, and wait for a note from Iran to start the war at one minute, one second, all of them together. Iran worked on this war for years, equipped them, armed them, trained them, and Qatar, in the name of Iran, sponsored them with the Qatari money. And all these militias were ordered to be prepared for the Iranian order to start a war at one minute. And Iran did not recruit states, only organizations. Why? Because states are bound with international law, international uh, uh, organizations like the United Nations, like the General Assembly, like uh, 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 Security Council, all kinds of uh, international tools which are designed to prevent wars and to make wars, you know, to detach between the war and the civilians, all these things. But organizations are free from any restriction. They do whatever they like, because the international law is not implemented on organizations, only on states. So this is why Iran preferred to operate through organizations rather than states. This satanic way how to feel no. to turn the Middle East into a failing area, Syria is failing state, so the organizations can work in Syria freely. Iraq is a failing state, mm -hmm. so the 50 uh, militias can work in Iraq freely, without any restriction. Lebanon is a failing state, the same. Gaza is not a state, the same. Uh, 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 Yemen is also a failing state, so the Houthis can do whatever they like over there. So this is uh, why they, su they support all these forces which dismantle these countries in order to be able to operate their militias from these countries. This is a really satanic plan, but they turn the Middle East into their home, into their front uh, uh, yard to fight through these organizations, through these uh, militias against Israel and others as well, like Saudi Arabia. So this is, by the way, Saudi Arabia knows very well, very well 
because Saudi Arabia was attacked by Iraqi militias and Yemenite and from Iran as well on the early morning of September 14, 2019, like five years ago, which destroyed, this attack destroyed some half of the oil production facilities of Saudi Arabia, if you remember. One early morning, and they attacked Saudi Arabia, and the damage which was caused to Saudi Arabia is tremendous. So they know already how to operate this kind of, maybe that one on Saudi Arabia was Hazara Generali, you know, General Rehearsal, two things which they are planning against Israel, could be. So, uh, the information we came, which came from my friend is that Iran actually prepares a multi-front uh, war against Israel because in their uh, calculation, Israel will collapse after three days. Why? Imagine a rain of missiles comes from Lebanon, thousand per day. You know, they have, according to media, they have like 150,000 missiles in Lebanon. So they can they can have a war against Israel 150 days, and each day we'll have thousands of missiles on Israel, on everything, on power stations, on water supply facilities, on roads, bridges, uh, army bases, air force, air force bases, uh, army storages, um, cities, hospitals, whatever. The, uh, in the Kirya, in, in Tel Aviv, the, the Mifalea Zikuk, the refineries in, 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 in Haifa, you know, they can devastate the whole country with thousands per day. Some of them are, are precise. So the, the Israel, and in, in addition to airstrike from missiles and, and drones, also land attack, like what was in the, in the, in the south, also from Lebanon. And the Radwan force, which uses a tractor on him, um, I don't know what you call it in English. Oh, in English. Oh. ATVs, ATV. ATVs uh, which were produced in Turkey, by the way. They have these big things with a big engine uh, with three people on it, one driver and one, one fighter with RPG and another one with a machine gun and ammunition in the in, in the in the box behind them, and uh, hundreds of these will assault uh, Nahariya, Shlomi, Maalot, Kiryat Shmone, uh, 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 Rosh Pina, and all the kibbutzim and moshavim in between them. Just imagine how many people they can capture, how many people they can kill. Okay, so what 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 was in 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 Gaza was only a small version of what could be in in in, in from Lebanon. Now all the reservists are at home because the roads are blocked. Uh, nobody can get to the army. And the uh, Israeli, actually, the army, means the Tzara Sadir, the regular army, they cannot face such a such, such a big attack, which will come from all, uh, and, and the militias in Syria and Iraq should invade Israel from the Golan, just what was happening in Gaza, and the, the Radwan force from the north. And this was the uh, Iranian plan. Hamas were not to attack by themselves. What happened in Shmini Atzeret was a surprise for the Iranians. It was a surprise for the Lebanese. Hamas decided to start a war by themselves only against the orders of the Iranians. How do I know? I'm not connected to any clandestine information. But, but, but I, my sources are open sources. I disconnect myself to the, to the army. I served only 25 years in the intelligence. But since I want to speak freely without uh, the, the need to sift what I say according to the sources, I decided to, to detach myself from any uh, uh, secret source. And I... And I base all what I say on open media. What happened after this uh, attack is 
of course, it was dreadful, especially the first day, and what happened later. Iran is not part of it. Hezbollah, in the beginning, they did nothing. They started shooting on the border only like after three or four days. Only then they started the border clashes. And what we have to, until today, including what happened on Shabbat, is not an all-out war which Hezbollah can wage against us. Not even one missile to Tel Aviv. Not even one missile to Netanyahu, thank God. Not even one missile to AACI French in Netanyahu, which is a very important facility, as you all know. And uh, uh, not even one to Haifa, not one to the refineries, nothing. All they do is in the north. They escalate a little bit during last, last Shabbat. But for 80 something days, the whole thing was about border clashes. This is not a war, according to what uh, uh, Hezbollah can do. Okay? And there's a reason why they don't bomb Tel Aviv. They heard about what happens in Gaza. They know that Israel actually drains Gaza already for 90 days, three months. Where are they? Where are the stockpile of the of the missiles? They don't do anything with this. And this is actually what happened. Hamas started the war without the consent of the Iranians and the Hezbollah. They were not supposed to use their weapons and the missiles and whatever they were given against Israel by themselves. How do I know? First of all, Hamas, eh, eh, Hezbollah and Iran did not take part in this until this very, until this very day, which they came. This first. Secondly, a few days after the war began, a guy named Musa Abu Marzouk is the more or less the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the of Hamas, the spokesman of Hamas. Uh, he was interviewed in one of the Arab media uh, channels, and, uh, and the interviewer asks him, uh, what uh, are the Iranians saying about this war? So he avoided the answer. So she, she asked him again, what are the Iranians saying about this? So, so he says, like, trying not to say, but he said it. Uh, I called them and they don't pick up the phone. <laughs> you know who doesn't pick up the phone? They see that he's uh, calling them. So they don't pick up the phone. Means that they are angry. How, how else can you explain it? So this was the first uh, a proof which I had that something he went wrong in the big satanic diabolic plan of, of Iran. Then after, after uh, uh, ah, the second proof was uh, by Hassan Asrallah. For this, you have to know the man. The, the man is a big talker. Whenever he sees a microphone, he gives a speech, even if the microphone is not connected to anything. Because he, he likes to speak. He, you know, he speaks very easily, very fluently. He has a, a note usually with points, but he doesn't read. He, he doesn't read his speeches. He speaks just look, just not to miss, uh, to miss the point. But uh, that's what he. The, the man, the man is very fluent in, in his speeches. Like every week, he delivers a speech. Usually not connected to Israel, so the Israel media doesn't make any, an issue out of it. But uh, uh, usually he sp speaks like once a week. Since the war started, it took him 28 days until he gave the first speech. Four weeks. Four complete weeks was Friday, the 20th day of, uh, of the war. 28 days, the man was in Minzar Shatkanim. Uh, we call it the Abbey of the Silent Monks. Uh, Abbey or Monastery. And uh, I never remember who is for the men or is for the women. But uh, 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 we didn't speak for 28 days. And the question is why? And the answer is clear. On one hand side, he cannot praise Hamas for what they did because they actually destroyed the, the Iranian plan. Because uh, like a week after the war started, 
the, the American fleet came to the, the fort uh, carrier and uh, like 12 uh, uh, ships around it with missiles, with uh, with uh, bombs, with all kinds of, of clay mashkit uh, uh, came in order to deter the Iranians and the, and the Lebanese. The, the, the Iranians didn't expect it. They didn't plan it. Uh, then half of the Israeli army is in the north, prevents any uh, um, uh, an incursion into his, into Israel, and uh, all the citizens in the cities of the kibbutzim are not there. So whom can they kill and kidnap? So actually, what happened is what Hamas did is actually destroying the Iranian plan. And uh, so he didn't want to praise them for what they did, but on the other side, he cannot condemn them for what they did because. They did a good job on the on the seventh, good job in his eyes, uh, on the seventh of October. So since he cannot praise them on one side, he cannot condemn them on the other side, he's decided not to speak at all. But uh, all of a sudden, the the rumors, maybe he's sick, maybe he's ill, maybe he's not here, maybe he ran away, maybe he's dead. Even there were rumors in the Arab world. Where is the man? Nobody hears about him, and so he came out and and gave a speech. Uh, in order, first of all, to calm all those who are worried about him, and uh, secondly, in order to, and he said, we were surprised, but good thing that we were surprised, because if they informed us, the Israelis might have intercepted the information, and they would be much more prepared. So thank God that they didn't let us know. <laughs> okay? This is how, that, my house, this is the second proof that he was uh, caught with surprise as well. The third one was like four, four weeks ago. Uh, Reuters uh, uh, informed that Ismail Haniya, the leader of Hamas, uh, came to visit Tehran in order to ask for some weapons to smuggle to Gaza, the people. Uh, and Khamenei, the leader, heard that he is in town. So he ordered his people to bring him to, bring him, to him. To, to Khamenei. And Reuters report that uh, the walls of the office were shaking because of the shouts which uh, Khamenei shouted at Hania for an hour and a half. What did you do? We gave you all these uh, weapons. We developed weapons for you. What did you think? That you were in free Palestine by yourself? Actually, this is how they think. And the worst is that they actually disobeyed the Iranians. And whoever knows how Iranians think, disobedience to a superior is something which is absolutely impossible in Iran. This is something which is totally against the culture. You don't disobey your superior. And since Khamenei is the one who gave them the money, gave money, gave them the in, in, in addition to Qatar, give them the weapons, give them the ammunition, give them the training and everything, he should be obeyed. And they did not obey. And this is why, from Iran point to, Iran's point of view and Hezbollah, Hamas can go to hell. And this is why they did not take part in this war until this very day. I don't know what will be in the future. In the future, Iran might think that time is coming you know, to to start a real war, big war against Israel, because A, B, and C. But so far, 90 more and more days, the Iranians are watching what happens in Gaza, and they do nothing. For me, it's the proof that they disobeyed the Iranians by starting this war and destroying the... By the way, today I got, by, by well, WhatsApp, I didn't read it yet, a whole manual of how to behave in a war, which was distributed to the, to the Hamas fighters. And this is based on Iranian uh, book, which uh, designs the behavior of the fighters in a war zone. So they translated part of it to Arabic, and I got uh, this uh, translation today. It's an official docu document by Hamas. I didn't have the time to read it here, but the, it says already that this is from the Iranian manual of how to uh, operate in the army in the war zone. So uh, definitely, uh, this is the situation. Now, I'm not in a, in a situation to thank Hamas 
for destroying the Iranian satanic uh, uh, plan, but uh, uh, the alternative uh, would have been much worse. Now we come to the third, to the third uh, uh, component of war, which is the opportunity. They uh, wanted to wage a war by themselves because they didn't see the Iranians acting against the Saudis who are advancing peace with Israel. Not only peace, normalization. And this is what pushed Hamas to uh, start the war already in this time. And they're not to wait the Iranians. The Iranians apparently are waiting for the time which they have nuclear weapon in order to be immune, in order to have an uh, insurance policy that nobody attacks them, even if they arrange such a big attack against Israel or against others as well. So uh, their timetable is different. Hamas uh, were very hasty because of this, because peace between Israel and Saudi Arabia is something totally different compared to the peace between Israel and the Emirates, Bahrain, or even Morocco. Why? These countries, Emirates, Bahrain, and Morocco are very important countries, but they are not the leaders of anybody. Whatever they do, they do for themselves. Saudi Arabia, on the contrary, is the leader of what remained from the Arab world, and worse, is the leader of the Islamic world. And they were afraid that if Saudi Arabia normalizes relations with Israel, states like Indonesia, Malaysia, Pakistan, all the stands in Central Asia, Tajikistan, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, all these, and in, in Africa, Mali, Chad, Niger, Nigeria, all these countries with majority or almost majority of Muslims, will stand in line to make peace, not peace, to recognize Israel and to, uh, to normalize relations with Israel. Who the heck will, will care about the Palestinian problem when this happens? If all the Arab and the Islamic world actually close the problem with Israel and Israel is being accepted, almost, by, by all these Arab and Islamic countries, who will care about the Palestinians? And the Palestinian cause will be, will evaporate. Nobody in the world will support it. If the Arab and the Islamic world make peace with Israel, the Europeans will continue to support the Palestinian cause when all the Arabs and Muslims betrayed the Palestinians because of Saudi Arabia so and the Americans. So for them to, to turn the table over for the Israelis and the Saudis was a mitzvah mid right to do it now before the elections in the States because they know that that Biden wants to, to have the, the photo op of the free hand shaking on the loan of the, of the White House between MBS and Netanyahu or whoever with the prime minister and, and, and him, Biden, uh, like in April, May 2024, was the elections in order to increase his, his uh, uh, chances to win the elections. So for him to win the elections, the, Palestinian cause should should die. Okay, this is what Hamas Hamas and this is actually what urged them to start the war at this time. They uh, uh, wanted to start a war in Leila Seder, in Pesach, but Israel discovered it and had the Kohenut. You know the people, the, the army was in alert, and and uh, they postponed it to the Hagim. Which and here now comes the opportunity. They decided to do it during the Hagim because they knew that during the Hagim, the army has a, a reduced presence on the borders. Had Mama will call it. Uh, they didn't start it on Rosh Hashanah, uh, which was on Shabbat, the first day. They didn't start it on Monday, which was Yom Kippur, ten days later. They didn't start it on the first of Sukkot which was Shabbat. They started it on Shemini Atzeret, which was Shabbat. Why? Usually, the population of Otef Aza is six, 7,000 people. The people who live in the Kibbutzim. On that morning of Shemini Atzeret, they had over 12,000 people. The Nova party. They knew about this party. 
First of all, it started on Thursday. After that. And they hear and they heard it. The pile of, of loudspeakers definitely covered Gaza as well. It's like three kilometers. Everybody hears it. Secondly, uh, it was on the internet. By Facebook. The registration was by, by Facebook. So they, can they get to Facebook and see? Definitely. But they saw the preparations on the ground because the preparation machine took like two weeks to prepare the scene, to build the stage, to build the the tent above the stage, the big, uh, colorful uh, tent, the white tents for the food and the, and the facilities and the parking and the generators and the, you know, everything which they bought there, a lot of things. And all these preparations were 150 meters from the road, 232, which goes along the Gaza with the Israeli side. So the workers whom they insisted on coming to Israel, who work in Israel in the farms of Rotef Aza, were actually spies from Hamas. And they saw the preparations. So to say they didn't know about this, this uh, this party is totally uh, illogical. Not only this, they timed it to 6.30 in the morning. Why 6.30 in the morning? It is sunrise. The people who participate in this, in this uh, event cannot run away uh, in the darkness. Because if they attack them at 2 or 3 a.m., it's dark. They could hide and they could run away. But in the morning, everybody is seen. Then most of them are very tired because they dance through the night. Some of them are drunk. Some of them are, you know what? And they are very, I would say, easy prey for those people who attack them. So this is why they timed this attack to Shmini Atzeret in the morning. And uh, yes, and they definitely took advantage. They actually thought that Israel has no army, because through the last year, they see all the balagan in, in, in Israel, the struggle over the judicial reform, and most of it, more important, they saw the petitions of uh, pilots who signed that they are not going to volunteer to the army, and the Shmone time officers, and they saw the Sayyarat Matkal, and Sayyarat this, and Sayyarat that, and Lohamea Cyber, and, uh, and uh, whatever, all those, because whenever there was a list which was published with another group of officers and soldiers who are not volunteering through the last year. They came out with halawiyat, with candies to the streets and celebrated the pilots, the 8200. That, okay. And for in their view, there was no army. And they actually planned to invade the Negev and to establish a line of defense in the Negev based on the kidnapped people. They didn't expect the army to come and to, to wipe them out from the Negev. They thought that they would be able and, and, and they will not lose the weapons, they will not lose uh, Gaza Strip. They, they, they planned a, a day or two days of clashes with Israel because Israel will not uh, 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 the lives of the people who are captured in risk. They assume. After all, Israel released uh, more than a thousand killers because of Gilad Shalit. So will Israel uh, 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 put in risk the lives of so many Israelis if they are kidnapped? Of course not. Israel will be deterred by the people who are kidnapped and tied uh, near the strongholds or whatever. So that's actually what they they decided to do, to have a day or two of clashes to release all the prisoners in Israel in return of the uh, releasing of the hostages, and they will come back to Gaza with uh, people who will release and keep Gaza with all the weapons, all the towns and everything which they have, and the whole world will cherish them and praise them for the big success which they succeeded to force Israel to release all the prisoners in one day or two days of clashes in the south. This is what they planned. They didn't plan to lose Gaza. They didn't plan to commit suicide as an organization. They didn't expect the... Uh, no. 
They didn't expect that Israel will occupy the Gaza Strip and vow to get rid of Hamas. If they knew that this would be the, res the, the result, most probably they wouldn't uh, start such a war. They would wait to the big plan of the Iranians, because that actually will, will uh, uh, populize altogether. Ladies and gentlemen, now we are in a war which actually mitgalgelet means every day brings the other day. Uh, Israel succeeded uh, to get rid of Hamas in the northern part of, of uh, Gaza. Gaza is divided to two to pass by the Nahal Absor, which is Nahal Aza. It's a valley in the middle of, uh, of Gaza, more or less. To the north is the, the city of Gaza, Beit Hanun, Beit Laya, and to the south, Khan Yunus, the Red Balach, and Rafia, Hassan, and some more places. And Israel is fighting. Uh, in, in this space, Israel will finish the job within two or three weeks. Uh, will they find the hostages alive or not? Nobody knows. Maybe people know already, but uh, I don't know. Uh, because they are there. And who knows what their fate is? Um, you know, our hearts are with the families of these, of these uh, people who are kidnapped. And then, uh, but nobody really knows that they are alive. So why stop the, the operation? Because if they are not alive, there's really no reason why to stop the, the operation because uh, there is no way to live near such a, an organization, which is like ISIS. And here, Israel succeeded tremendously in branding Hamas as ISIS. And Israel started it from the beginning. I also took part in this as a speaker. And on Jazeera, uh, already in the second day, it was Sunday, I was interviewed by Jazeera in English. And uh, I said, this is ISIS like Hamas. I said it like three or four times along the, the interview in order to, to make it clear. And they were very angry. It was on live broadcast, so they couldn't uh, erase it. And the, after the interview, the, the editor actually called me and uh, shouted at me, why did I compare them to ISIS? They are not ISIS, they are Hamas. So I said, look, uh, the division of roles between you guys and me is that you, you phrase the questions and I phrase the answers. If you want to phrase the answers as well, you don't need me. So, so if you if you have me on air, so this is me. I'm not. I'm Zionist. I'm Jewish. I care for Israel, and I say what I say. Uh, next time, don't interview. So you, you, you're sure we're not going to interview you anymore. Okay, <laughs> I did my job. Uh, they, they are jihadist. Uh, channel, no doubt, in, in all its forms, in the English channel, in the Arabic channel, ch channels, there are like 10, 10 channels on Jazeera. So, uh, bottom line, Israel is at war uh, against uh, Hamas, and Israel had no other choice but to win this war in a very decisive way, which will be more than obvious to any everyone. Because Israel must retrieve it's deterrence. Because Israel can live in this area in one of two situations. One is a constant war, which Israel will survive because Israel is at war and fights the enemies. But this is no way to how to live in this country because you have to bring this, the, the, the soldiers back to, to work, to home, and to have normal life. Being at war for 90 days is way too much. And more is almost impossible. Uh, the other way how to live in the Middle East is to have deterrence. And deterrence can deter them from waging war against us if they are afraid of us. Now, what happened in Israel is that the army was forced to work according to the rules of proportionality. This was one of the inventions of the Supreme Court 
uh, which says that if they kill one Israeli, you cannot kill a thousand of them. You, you can kill one, maybe two, but not, not, not more than this, because your retaliation should be proportional. Okay, proportionality actually killed the deterrence. Because deterrence occurs or happens when if they kill one of us, we kill hundreds of them. So they are afraid of us. If if we kill only one, they are not afraid. They will kill one of us and then we will sacrifice one of them. So first of all, we have to change the rules of engagement in order to become a, a, a dangerous country. And if Israel, uh, in the Middle East, the reason there in Islam, after all, Islam cannot take Israel, so how can we survive in this area? In Islam, there are mechanisms, or one mechanism, it's called Salam Hudaybiyah, the peace of Hudaybiyah, uh, which actually is a precedent made by Muhammad, the prophet, uh, who gave temporary peace to the infidels of Mecca, in a village named Hudaybiyah. He gave them temporary peace for nine years, nine months, and nine days. It was almost 10 years. However, they went to sleep. They fell asleep on God. And after two years, when he see that they are not alert anymore, he attacked them and violated the agreement after two years. So from this, Muslims learn two things. If you're Muslim, if you are weak and the, your enemy is strong and vicious and dangerous and invincible, so you can give him a temporary peace. This is one thing. The second thing is, if your enemy falls asleep on God, you can do to him whatever you like, even within the time or the period of the temporary peace. Okay? This is what we can expect here in the Middle East. A Hudaybiyah peace, a temporary peace. If Israel will be strong, deterring, vicious, dangerous, and invincible, Israel will enjoy temporary peace. However, if Israel will be powerful, dangerous, vicious, deterring, and invincible forever, Israel will enjoy temporary peace forever. Thank you so much. Brilliant. There are some questions I would think. So, um, um, I was going to ask a question about his well, when, um, <clears throat> when the war started. Yeah. Sorry. It'll be the second. Uh, okay. Okay. So, okay. Sir. I'd like to ask a question about Hezbollah. Wait, wait, um, wait for the mic. In your opinion, is Nasrallah? And then you'll repeat in it. In your opinion, is Nasrallah more Lebanese or more interested in Iran? The question is: Is he willing to sacrifice Lebanon to feed his Iranian masters? This question is depends when. Uh, in the morning, he can be very zealous Lebanese. At noon, he can be very zealous Islamists. We, with them, with them, you know, other parts of the Islamic world. In the evening, he will be totally Iranian. It all depends on the context, as we heard recently. Uh, but to be serious, um, let's say 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when we looked at demonstrations of uh, of Hezbollah, we saw only yellow flags, the Hezbollah flags. When you saw the demonstrations of others opposed Hezbollah, like the Christians or the Sunnis, you always saw the Lebanese flags. So it was clearly the Lebanese identity or the I, I, Lebanese affiliation versus the Hezbollah, which is affiliated and loyal to its own agenda, the yellow, which is represented by the yellow. As of five years ago, more or less, 
you see in the demonstrations of Hezbollah, the mixture of the yellow flags and the Lebanese flag. Means Hezbollah endorsed, embraced the Lebanese flag. Why? As they say now, let us and what? Means we are the state. We are Lebanon. Lebanon is us. So for them, the flag of Lebanon and the flag of Hezbollah are more or less the, well, of course, it's a different flag. But for them, we are both. We are Lebanese and Hezbollah because today Lebanon belongs to Hezbollah. This is how things evolve with the years. Hey, Marty. Um, and when, the, when the war first uh, started, I, I thought that a different scenario was playing out, that uh, Hamas was uh, forcing Israel into Gaza, and that, that would tie up the Israeli army. And then with these thousands of rockets from Gaza, Israel would be using up its Iron Dome, and so that when the army is stuck in Gaza and when the Iron Dome is out of rockets, then Hezbollah would shoot its big missiles and it would come across the border. It, it seems to me that that would be a, a good strategy to use. Um, you know what? I cannot deny this possibility. Yet, in my humble view, if uh, Sinwar knew that uh, Gaza means the whole, it, it, actually the whole uh, strip is in, inhabitable. It, it, you, you can't live there anymore. You know, now it will have to be reconstructed almost totally. Almost totally. Even buildings which still are still standing up, they, they were shaken. And the, the foundations, are, you know, after you blow up, Israel blows up all the towers from the, you don't want to live in these buildings anymore. They have to be straight, flattened with the earth and start the whole thing again. So uh, I more than believe that uh, he didn't expect it. He didn't want it. And if he knew that this would be the future of Gaza, the way it looks now, uh, he wouldn't uh, start such, such a thing. He didn't bring it in, in, in the cover. Should we check on the chat? Um, Let's do let's do some questions yeah. from the room, and then we'll ask you to tell yeah, people to put it in the chat. They should put it in the chat. Are you in favor of people from Gaza being moved to the Belgian Congo or anywhere else? No, that's not right. Okay. Ah, ah, ah. Madagascar. Yeah, Me? Uh, do, do I do I uh, support uh, people for the Zoom? Uh, do I support the uh, mass migration? You would say, yeah. or people from Gaza. And do you think it Look, will happen? <laughs> no, this is a different question. Uh, do I believe in this? Look, Syria, since the war, the civil war started in Syria in March of 2011, some 6.7 million Syrians left Syria. Some of them means like a million in Jordan, some of them in Lebanon and some of them in Turkey, two million in Turkey, and the rest to Europe, to America, to many other countries. Uh, since the war in Iraq, uh, started in 2003, million and a half Iraqis ran away. And the wars in Afghanistan caused two million of Afghanis flee to Iran until this very day. Uh, the world, you, you know, the world knows uh, uh, what it what it means a war, and in order to save lives, people are running from place to place. Okay, and let, let alone forced migration has happened after the Second World War with the Sudeten, who, who were who million of them were kicked out from Czechoslovakia in those days, today Czech Republic. So the world didn't collapse because of mass migration of people from war zones. First of all, in order to keep their lives. So, so this one thing. Second thing, the country which is most responsible for what happened, what happened in Gaza is Qatar. Qatar sponsored Hamas for many years. Qatar sponsored the, the, the weapons and everything which they had in Gaza. 
Therefore, Qatar is responsible. The Qatari, uh, uh, El, uh, you know, the El Al of what is it, the airline. airline of Qatar owns 269 airplanes. Average capacity of each of them is 300 passengers. No, 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 no. 269. I made the calculation. Uh, if, each, if each and every uh, airplane uh, goes back and forth between El Arish, which is 50 kilometers from Gaza in Egypt, from El Arish to Qatar, it's two, two and a half hours of flight. Every airplane can do it very easily five times a day. This will. Every airplane and all the and all the airline of Qatar can take two million people to Gaza within a week, easily, within a week. Do you see a problem for this? <laughs> if, if you know, I'm saying if if Qatar is responsible, let Qatar do something in order to save those people. Now, in Qatar, as you remember. Qatar hosted the World Cup, the soccer. Yeah, uh, only what? November of a of, uh, year ago, 2022. Um, they have enough dormitories, which were built for the World Cup hotels. And they have enough money to build in no time uh, normal housing, you know, uh, uh, Niakala, a light building. They can do it with their gazillions what they have in, in, in the banks of their own because of the gas which they produce. They could solve the agony. They could spare the agony of these people within a week. So, but the world, the Palestinian problem, which they actually destroyed, the Qataris. And this is the problem. The world does not impose the Arab world to bear the consequences of what they do. You know, it's called racism of lower expectations. The world actually treats the Arab world in some kind of racism because the expectations are low. What Arabs should bear consequences of what they did? What happened? Well, okay, this is how the world looks at it. This is why the world does not demand Qatar to solve the problem which they made. Uh, on one of the previous occasions you spoke here, you were talking about the possibility of Arab nations being run on a clan system, which is how they've done it for thousands of years, instead of trying to impose Western republicanism. Do you think that could work in Gaza? And what would be the effect long term? Well, uh, Netanyahu was quoted uh, like a week ago uh, saying to the army officers in Gaza, when he was in Gaza, start working with the Hamulot. Start working with the clans. Where do you think he got this idea? <laughs> <laughs> But it's also the cat Okay, so let me Gaza, the 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 Red Aza, the, the strip is divided uh, to five administrative uh, divisions. There yeah, are uh, parts from the administrative, like Nafat Sharon, Galil, okay. Uh, from north to south, Betlaya Beit Hanun is the most north one. Gaza, the city, Dir el Balach, Khan Yunis, and Rafia, Rafa, which is next to the Egyptians. And this uh, division was made according to the families, means to the clans, because this, first of all, this uh, division was made already, I think, in the days of the Egyptians, dozens of years ago, because the clans live in that place. They get bigger and bigger, but they don't move. And they, those who divided the strip to these five groups, 
actually honored the family spaces. They didn't mix. Oh, no, they, they mixed, but they didn't divide families in the middle by the border between, let's say, Deir Barach and, 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 and uh, Khan Yunus. Okay. They made the line in a such a way which will keep the families uh, as unit. Because for them, the family or the space of the family is the homeland. If you go to another family, you are in Galut. No, no, this how they, the, the, you are not in your place because the language is different, the people are different, you are not one of us. It's all the tribalism which I talked about. Yes, and uh, this is why we should not to mention the, the Judea and Samaria, which would divide uh, the cities. Every city should be an emirate. And uh, this is actually the idea which I gave to all kinds of people here in this country uh, already like a month ago, when they started to talk about the day after. So, okay. Once we deal with Gaza, we still have the north, all the people displaced, you know, by, by uh, Lebanon and Syria. And how do we get to a situation where they can get back home? Uh, well, this is the billion dollar question, which everybody is running around in this country. Look, in my humble view, uh, Hezbollah are not willing to enter a big war with Israel. They are looking for a temporary peace. It means because they cannot uh, carry out the big plan of Iran now. Because there's the citizens of the north are not in the place. So there is nobody so there is nobody to kidnap and to kill. And the army is there to kill them. So today is not appropriate. It's not a good time to start a war which they planned. Yet, to tell you for sure that he will not start tomorrow an uh, out war against Israel, I am not. I cannot because I don't have, you know, direct connection with the Nasrallah. So, yeah, I don't know. But... Uh, in my assessment, uh, his willingness is to get rid of Israel altogether. He, by himself, he cannot do it. He needs the others as well. Now, as you remember, what I said about the 17 militias in Syria and the 50 militias in Iraq, if I knew that they are on the borders of the Golan, I would say, hey, they are preparing something multi-front war. But since I don't see them in the Golan yet, I have the reason to believe that Nasrallah is not uh, hiring up uh, to a war with us. Because alone, he knows that he will, he will fail. Especially after Israel finishes with, with Hamas, then we'll be able to deal with him. We have two more questions from the audience, and then we're going to go to uh, the chat program. Okay. okay. Uh, in your opinion, wouldn't you say that uh, maybe the Egyptians are just as much to blame as Hamas for all this problem? Because it's Qatar. 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 Qatar is the one that is involved in all the finance. But it's the Egyptians that actually are the ones that are allowing all this weaponry into Gaza. If they, if Israel or, or the world somehow could have controlled all this armor coming into Gaza, we would never be in this situation. Definitely, you're definitely right. But don't forget that with, with Egypt, we have diplomatic relations, which Israel tries to keep in any, in, in, in any cost. Israel will not do things which will agree with the Egyptians uh, because uh, we don't want to shake the peace with them. We, we have too much is at stake with them. We don't need them also. And don't forget that the Egyptians are not Israeli friends. Let's put it mildly. Uh, their, their military abilities are too big to our taste. 
they have too many tunnels under the canal, the Suez Canal, which can enable them to stream their forces into Sinai. And uh, although they have problems with the Ethiopia because of the of the Renaissance uh, then, yet uh, Israel tries not to wake up the Egyptian alligator. <laughs> We are, we are only going to be the square one. Oh, yeah. if, look, there are, today I heard um, Yadli, um, Amos Yadli, saying something like, we should stop the war now. Stop the war now. Uh, come to an agreement with Hamas for the releasing of all the hostages. And we can take care of Hamas in half a year or a year. It doesn't have to be today. In my humble view, this was the most stupid uh, thing to say. Why? If we stop the war now, everything which we achieved is nullified. Why? Hamas, we, we are still operating. Two okay. or three battalions they have in Rafiah and in Khan Yunus. They are still fighting. They, if there's no, no fight, they will go back to the north, will take over the city of Gaza, will take everything, and will renew their, uh, their presence. And no other solution will be there if the activists or, or terrorists of, of Hamas are standing with, with, with the weapons and threaten the people. Every plan about families, about whatever you plan, will not be able to, to be implemented if Hamas come back to power and it will happen within one day if Israel stops the war now. So, and I really, I, I, I was so shocked to hear it that Yadin said this. And the man was the head of the Israel intelligence. Guys, what? I, I'm really shocked. But here I must tell you something. Uh, the head of the intelligence here in Israel, unfortunately, is of course in the in the Matea Klali, in the in the high quarters, headquarters of the of the army. The position of Rosh Agaf Modi'in is something which the officers are manning uh, in 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 rotation. Let's say you can be the head of Pikud Safon, Vaket Pikud Safon, then you become the Rosh Agaf Mivtsaim. You know, operations, then you get, become Rosh Agaf Modi'in, then you become Sgan Ramatkal, then you become Ramatkal. Okay, this is the more that the, the root of advancement. Means uh, to be head of the intelligence is one of the positions of the Matkal, which is like uh, musical chairs uh, uh, between them, in order to train you, in order to be um, chief of staff. This, in my humble view, is wrong because nothing which you learn when you when you command a division or run with tanks or with cannons or with any other kind of an army. Nothing prepares you to, to be a, a real intelligence man because intelligence is something totally different compared to running tanks and, 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 and yeah. cannons and infantry. Intelligence is a profession. And until you become a, somebody who knows how to think as an intelligence man, you are already in Keva. You know, I remember myself coming to the intelligence. I served 25 years. I'm telling you, three years I learned on the job. All the first three years were training. So to take somebody who until yesterday was commander of tanks and, and, and cannons and to tell him the day later that now you become the commander. No, the chief uh, the chief analyst of the intelligence, it cannot work. And you know what? Between you and me, Israel so far had one uh, head of uh, Agaf Modi'in who was a good one. Aaron Ze'evi Farkash. He came from the high, from the, from intelligence. He was not the commander of tanks and cannons. He came from a unit, from Shmona Matai. He, and he knew what intelligence, he speaks Arabic. 
he, he has the intelligence in his feeling, not in theory or not in papers which he reads or doesn't read. He made, he was an Ish Modi'in, you know, in all his blood and flesh. And this is why, in my view, he was the best uh, uh, Rosh Aman until this very day. As, as a little proof, they, Herzi Alevi, the chief of staff, chose him to be part of the committee which he wants to establish in order to check the failures of the army, including the intelligence of, uh, of the October 7th. And Aaron Zevi Farkash was the one who was chosen by Herzi Alevi to uh, uh, check the intelligence. Because he knows what intelligence is. Um, we had another one, Uri Sagi. Well, he was also the chief of the intelligence uh, in, in the Matkal. In the, uh, after he, you know, uh, he was resigned, he established an organization to make peace with Syria and to give Assad the Golan. Eli Sagi, not Eli Sagi, uh, um, what did she just said? Uri Sagi. Uri Sagi, the man who should know, so should know something. Told he was Rosh Aman, but he's not an intelligence man. He doesn't understand what Syrians are. Today we see. Thank God we didn't listen to him. And, and because if, if we did, now we had Hezbollah on the, above Tveria, not only near Naria. In the Golan. And whoever was in the Golan knows exactly what I mean. Okay, so this is what, what I say that heads of the intelligence usually are people who are not from the intelligence. Yadin was a pilot. And I salute him. He might have been a very good pilot, very good commander of the Air Force. But what made him an Ish Modi'in? Modi'in is a profession. He mentioned the problem of uh, proportionality in military actions and mentioned the Supreme Court as the source of that. Where did you get the information about the Supreme Court? Other than a, a, a recent cartoon, I haven't heard of the Supreme Court uh, uh, interfering with the military policy or being asked to uh, 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 to uh, deal with military policy. Which Supreme Court? Which Supreme Court? Okay. Supreme Court of the State of Israel. What? I've been living in the State of Israel and reading newspapers for, well, I've been living in Israel for over 50 years, reading newspapers a little bit less. Supreme Court decision in the Supreme Court cases are usually published. And? And, uh, you didn't hear about proportionality? And, uh, and, uh, proportionality, or did somebody else uh, tell you the story? That is a lie, I should say. Are you asleep for like uh, 10, 10 years? Uh, <laughs> wait for your whole part. <laughs> Sir, the, the Supreme Court forced the army all kinds of uh, rules which were, which were, uh, let's say, found or not found or established only in recent years. Uh, uh, we heard about this. We didn't hear about this. Uh, uh, recent, uh, a couple of recent Supreme Court uh, cases about Boston. Spirut, uh, trying to think how to say it in English, the reasonable is the Supreme Court has rules that ministers and government officials have, have to act uh, reasonably. I haven't heard of them ruling that, uh, that uh, the declarations of war or acts of war have to be reasonable. It's not the same thing as proportional. It's not, it's not even well, worse. apparently you don't read the papers which I read. I'm sorry? Apparently you don't read the papers which I read. Well, 
So Google, Google proportionality, Supreme Court, and you'll find all the verdicts which they which they force the army. You know what? Let me tell you, give you a good example. You remember the name Tali Khatueli? Tali Khatuel was a lady who was living in Gush Katif. And uh, she was murdered with uh, some daughters of her, Gera. Uh, and, and the terrorists who murdered her uh, actually uh, got strongholed in a building right overlooking the road to Gush Katif from Israel. So the army wanted to destroy this, this building so they cannot hide in the building and shoot at cars, which like 10 meters from the, from the building. So one of the, I think Betzelem uh, appealed to the Supreme Court, you know, to prevent the, the demolishing of this house. So uh, the, the, the army came and says, hey, look, it's, uh, we have to, to, to destroy it because, because this is too close. So the, the, the Supreme Court says, we don't have the proof that it can be dangerous. So they it's not proportional to, to destroy by a house. So uh, I, I think you don't read the right papers. <laughs> you know, let me let me tell you very easily. The struggle is not between right and left. It's between right and wrong. Yeah. Yeah, questions? What is on in the chat? In the chat. Let me read some questions. Please type it into the chat box. Our enemies have okay. poten potentially put together a long term plan to try to try to destroy Israel. What should our what should be our long term plan to defeat them? Be strong forever. Be deterring forever. Erase proportionality from the vocabulary, and uh, and uh, and, and uh, otherwise, because there is there is no deterrence with proportion proportionality. If you knew this, I am sure the Israel intelligence community should have known this. What uh, yes, and usually I I whatever I got from the men in Europe I I sent to the army. This time I I decided to write a whole article about this because um, it's not only for the army to know this. It's also for municipalities. It's also for Meshekish at It's also for the electricity company. Mekorot should know about this because a non out war against Israel actually touches every every kind of activity in the country. The the, the trains, the roads, everything, everything should know. So I consulted with the editor of Makorishon, where I published my my uh, weekly the articles, and he said, yes, we are going to publish it because if people in Iraq are talking about this, if people in Syria, if people in Lebanon, Gaza, Yemen, if they are all preparing you know, and talking about this, shouldn't we know about this? So, and within a day, uh, I saw this article translated to English, to French, to Arabic, maybe to other languages as well. And it, it, it until this very day, it is on my blog on Makor uh, dated uh, April 9, 2023. So you can read it in Hebrew. And I believe you can, if you Google it, you will uh, find it in in, uh, in English as well. You are well versed in the background of the situation. Is there any possibility of a long-term solution? Yes, be strong for long-term, you will be having a long-term okay. Why did Saudi Arabia stop the, stop the process of normalization with Israel after 7th of October? Yeah, when, when the cannons are singing, the muses are silent, right? Uh, you cannot make peace when there is a war uh, between Israel and some Arabs. This is too shameful for the Saudis. Uh, it's shameful enough that they making peace with Israel when, when it comes to the accusations of Hamas. But uh, 
uh, what about the Jewish claim to Israel according to the Surah 5 in the Quran? Look, uh, so th there are in some places in the Quran which says, uh, for example, that the, the Allah said to the Israelites in the desert, or oh, Banu Israel means the sons of Israel, uh, come to the holy land which I registered for you. Katamon. Uh, so many people uh, say, hey, here, see, Eretz Israel is registered for us. The context is very bad because the, the Pasuk which follows it says, but the Israelites did not accept it. They betrayed Allah. They said to Allah, go get rid first from the giant people who live there, then we'll trust you. Okay? The, the, the picture is rather negative. Allah gave them the country, but they refused to get it unless Allah first, and they didn't believe in Allah, that Allah will kick out all these anakim from, from the country. As uh, what's mentioned in Parashat Shalach. Okay? So the, whenever, once I mentioned it, so the other part started to laugh. And he quoted the next, the next verse. And another another verse which says that uh, we gave you merits more than other nations I mean, to the Jews, to the Israelites. Means we lifted you above the other nations. So uh, some Jews are quoting this verse as well. But the next verse says but you did not accept the right religion. You betrayed Allah, and so Allah kicked you out. So, yes, there are verses which are sounds in favor of the Israelites, but the context is uh, usually rather sure. rather negative. I'm going to have to stop you. I'm sure we could go on all night. I think everybody will agree with me that this was absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much. Time's out. Let's let's reach. Great success to the army. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Condolences to the families who lost their beloved ones. Refuash Lema, the wounded, and first return home, all the kidnapped. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, everybody.